Hello everyone and uh, welcome back to the PMF IS Current Affair Prelim Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik. So we are going to discuss in this particular video the second set of the questions that is question 21 to question number 40. I hope you have uh, enjoyed and learned a lot of things from the first part of our test number 2 which was conducted on the 15th of the February. Now in this particular video we will be talking about the next 20 questions and I am going to discuss each and every important detail about the question how to approach it and how you should handle these kind of questions in your prelims exam. So let us get started with our first question that was question 21. So this particular question of your test was with respect to the uh, a very important uh, bill which was passed as Digital Personal Data Protection Act 2023. Now this particular uh, you know information was uh, very very much in the news and we all were talking about the digital uh, data protection and personal data protection that is why it's a very relevant question especially with respect to the kind of uh, data privacy is in uh, talk these days so it's a very obvious kind of question and something that is of very much importance now what first what you are supposed to know first about this digital personal data protection act because it is about a specific act specific law Without having the knowledge of Digital Personal Data Protection Act, you may not be able to solve this particular question. So first of all, I'll tell you the basics that you need to keep in the mind while solving this question. This particular act, this act is all about protecting your personal data. Personal data is every data that we are creating in terms of our videos, in terms of our uh, messages, in, in terms of any digital footprint that we are creating right now. And this particular uh, act says that the personal data can be processed only for a lawful purpose if government has to use your personal data. It can be done only for some very specific lawful purpose and every personal data is to be processed only after the consent of the individual. That is the, that is the real aim. My data is my data. If government wants to use it for some specific purpose, of course, it, it is up to my consent. First, I have to approve that, okay, fine, you can use my data, then only they can use that particular data, right? Without my consent, that cannot be done. However, very interestingly, this particular act says, this con consent of the individual can be withdrawn at any point of time. If I think that my data is being misused for some purpose, I can withdraw my consent. That is a very important thing. Now, this bill also talk about that there are some few cases where consent will not be required if the if uh, you know uh, these kind of uses are going to be done like for example if government needs your data uh, for, for with respect to employment medical emergency or for the purpose of benefit that is going to be given by the government to you or any specific uh, purpose that government think that you know consent is not required now this is of course this is one of the criticism of the act also because by by uh, going with this exception of course you are going to create a loophole uh, where the government may use your data for its own definition and that can become a surveillance kind of thing but yes this is what it was there in the in this particular act now very importantly uh, why all these data privacy and everything is there because in 2017 there was a very landmark judgment given by the supreme court of india and it was the Puttuswami versus Union of India case 2017 where Supreme Court held that right to privacy it is an intrinsic part under the article 21. Before 2017 right to privacy was not considered as a fundamental right but now it has become a fundamental right under article 21 which is about right to life and personal liberty and right to privacy is considered as an essential part of this particular uh, article. From this point onwards there was a necessity for information privacy, data personal, uh, personal data protection. Every concept that is there has its roots in this particular act. Okay. Now, if you if you look at the question, you will understand the question is very simple. If you know the basics of this particular act, the first line absolutely correct. There is no problem with this. The consent becomes uh, uh, important. Yes, and the consent can be withdrawn at any time. Right to privacy is a fundamental right under Article 21. I think this is a very straightforward question. Uh, this you can still solve without even knowing it. But yes, uh, if you have even read this kind of uh, uh, act once, very easily you can solve it. There is no trick and turn in that. I think the level is uh, easy and uh, you, you have already attempted it, I'm sure. Okay, 
in case in case you are even not even heard of it just think about it why 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 the government would will uh, start the personal data protection and every time you think of the personal data protection of course there has to be a consent because without consent the the data cannot be protected right so that logic on also can be applied and still you can solve it with little bit of the common sense now question number 22 was about a scheme now for this these kind of topics you have to be very specific now the scheme that you are supposed to uh, pick up pick out the scheme it is specifically about providing the debt financing debt financing for what particular purpose for all the stalled housing projects okay now you are supposed to you are you are given the four schemes and uh, if you are if you are not aware about the schemes you, if you do not know their full forms then this question becomes really tough because absolutely there is no scope of doing any guesswork here but at least i uh, if if you have heard of some of the schemes try to first eliminate that like for example we have heard about pradhan mantri swanidhi yojana we know it has some connection with the covid times where the government has started this program to help the street vendors right so street vendors were uh, were given loans collateral free loans 10000 20000 50000 or different different uh, uh, criterias were there so clearly this has nothing to do with the real estate similarly nai udan is actually a project by ministry of minority affairs for those uh, students who are who belong to the minority groups and it is about supporting them in their in their preparation of the civil services so clearly nai udan is cannot be there now of course we have a confusion with, between these two now sankalp because i have read about it for example now sankalp is something which is about the skill training it is it has to do with the skill development skill training uh, of of the of the youth so uh, it is it also does not belong to the real estate so right answer has to be swamit i know this is a bit tough question because there is no scope you have to be very careful and very accurate about these kind of questions if you have absolutely no idea if you have not heard any of them i will not suggest you to risk it then you should skip it but if you if you have little bit idea and if at least you are able to know uh, two of the four statements then still you can risk depending on uh, how you are performing and what is the score you are expecting in your prelims exam then you can risk it but you have to be very careful now in this particular question if you know about the full form of the swami swami scheme then things become easy for you if you have read about the full form the swami scheme specifically talks about a special window for the affordable and mid income housing the name itself is talking about the housing so that becomes very clear uh, for this particular thing now swami scheme uh, to give you a bit more information it it is about providing funding for all those projects which are stalled for some reason and if there is any project which is not able to get completed in 2019 the government has started this funding scheme and here you will get the priority debt financing for all the real estate projects of india that are stalled that are not being completed to give them a push now for this purpose the government has established the swami fund this fund is important guys why this fund was there okay you may also have a question about the fund itself no the swami fund is about what it is about the real estate it is about the housing projects so that also you have to keep in the mind this particular fund is important why because this was created as an aif fund aif means alternative investment fund where investments are done in the non traditional uh, you know non traditional ways generally we invest in stocks or other like things but these are the alternative investment funds where for some specific purpose we are doing the investment this uh, this swami fund it is registered by uh, registered with the ab in fact all the aif funds are registered with sebi sebi is the security exchange board of india responsible for all the stocks uh, stock market and everything and to be specific about this fund swami fund it is sponsored by ministry of finance this sponsoring part is important guys sponsored by ministry of finance and managed by the sbi cap venture limited now these are the information you always have to be very careful about you must know this information because otherwise you will not be able to solve this kind of question of course it was a tough one you need to have a specific knowledge about it and uh, that is how uh, the question needs to be done now if you if you want to learn more about the alternative investment funds in the pdf it is given please read about it it's a very simple explanation you must know about the alternative investment schemes that we are having 
and you have also we have also given all the details of uh, other schemes which were there like for example the sankalp scheme the the udan uh, udan everything is being mentioned you can read it's a simple explanation question number 23 was with respect to the provision of the panchayat extension to scheduled areas which is very commonly known as the pisa act so you are supposed to talk about the this particular act now this is a this is again a very uh, you know you need to have certain knowledge about this act because you need to have a very accurate information for solving this kind of question first what basic things you need to know about the pisa act 1996 let me tell you guys it was after the bhuria committee then the government of india has enacted the pisa act 1996 the main purpose was the tribal self rule in india scheduled areas every scheduled area of the india needs to have the tribals that they should have some kind of representation they should have some kind of self rule for for empowering the gram sabha of that area because gram sabha under this particular act it is the gram sabha that is considered to be the absolute authority gram sabha is the one that is given autonomy gram sabha has to implement every provision whatever the provisions are there with respect to scheduled areas it is the gram sabha that has to implement them in the at the grassroots level the state has only an advisory role ultimate authority is the gram sabha i mean this is one of the few acts that actually gives very strong local uh, governance that actually make the local governance very powerful and that is why this act is always going to be relevant for your upsc exam overall it is the ministry of panchayat raj under which the pisa act works that is important guys now with respect to scheduled area those uh, if you are not aware of the scheduled areas scheduled areas are basically those areas which have a very prominent population of the tribal people if lots of tribal people are living in that particular area it is considered to be a scheduled area every scheduled area is notified by the president it is only and only president of course by while declaring any area as scheduled area the uh, the advice of the governor is taken into account but ultimately it is the president who notifies okay this particular area is going to be considered as a scheduled area and it is the president who has the responsibility of the administration of that particular area of course it uh, the president does the administration via the route of the governor that is a separate thing but ultimately the onus lies on the president that is a very very important guys now second thing that you have to be very careful like i told you that it is the gram sabha that is going to be responsible for the management of the natural resources because gram sabha is really empowered in this group and every local self governance decision is to be taken by this particular gram sabha every plan project everything is to be done because it's a bottom up approach this scheme is not about trickle down it is about the bottom up approach which is required and it is about safeguarding the rights and the uh, you know rights of the people of the tribal areas but very importantly guys you have to be careful about one particular thing you know we have uh, we have got the panchayati raj system under the 73rd amendment act be careful 73rd amendment act does not it it does not automatically cover all the scheduled areas for that purpose every scheduled area which provisions are to be implemented or not to be implemented that is going to be decided later on it is not that once you have passed the 73rd amendment act and you started the panchayati raj system it is not automatic because scheduled area needs special protection so please remember any act of the parliament does not automatically apply to scheduled areas scheduled area before implementing any act to scheduled area it is thoroughly reviewed it is with the consultation of the people it is with the consultation of the governor then only the provisions are extended and this is not just for this particular act for every act of the parliament scheduled areas are always going to be assessed first and then there will be implementation and that is exactly where the third statement was wrong the third statement said that this particular act automatically cover the scheduled areas if something is going to cover automatically tell me then why what is the use of a special protection so you, you once you are calling them as special areas of course the things are not going to get automatically covered right it 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 require further legislation it is the state that has to take care governor comes into the play then only the provisions are extended not just for the act for the all kind of act of the parliament the first two statements are correct i think it's a medium question the third you can you can simply solve by applying the logic 
if you have read at least once about the scheduled areas i think you can easily cover that and specifically when you're talking about the panchayat always whenever the panchayat raj you are talking about the local governance absolutely gram sabha is going to have the major play so applying that logic it's a medium one i think you should risk it at least you are aware of the two of the three statements it's a it's a normal one uh, so go for these kind of questions they are they are they look difficult at the first instance but yes you can solve them later on you can solve them with bit little bit of the common sense question number 24 was was with respect to the manrega now every we all have heard about manrega n number of times okay manrega we know it is about the 100 days of the unskilled wages yes manrega is a very important scheme in india specifically for the rural people and we are guaranteeing them if anybody wants to be a part of the workforce at least 100 days of the work is guaranteed by the program okay in one particular financial year you are going to give 100 days of the work in case you are eligible you have registered yourself you want to work and the government is not going is not uh, you know um, is not able to give you the employment within 15 days of your registration then you will be given as unemployment allowance so if you are willing to work within 15 days it is the it is the responsibility of the government to give you the work everything is fine about this question manrega has uh you know has a uh, backing of the article 41 article 41 actually talk about uh, it it is uh, it's a part of dpsp and it actually talks about that the state needs to secure to the citizens the right to the work that is important but there is one problem with this question and that is statement number 3 just apply your forget about any logic just apply your common sense in the question number 3 guys the statement 3 says the manrega is the only legislation in india recognizing right to work as a fundamental right tell me have you ever read right to work as a fundamental right you have read about the fundamental rights right from the article 20 to 35 in any of these articles have you read about the right to work fundamental no right to work in india is a legal right it is a legal right under manrega and please just apply this try to think about it we are a country of 140 crore people do you think that in india it is possible to give right to work as a fundamental right because if that is the case how we are going to have so many jobs we are we have a huge workforce with us in any case india cannot make right to work as a fundamental right it will be a mess it will be a huge burden on the government of india right and of course so go by that logic right to work is a legal is a legal right not the fundamental right guys and even if you know about this article 41 it is a dpsp and directive principle of state policy only they are non enforceable they are only the guidelines for the government that what government should do what they should not do right so third is incorrect i think the answer is um, i would say it's a medium one but you should attempt it there is nothing wrong with this answer has to be c only three right for more details you can read about it uh, be very careful one about one thing manrega is not talking about any uh, urban employment i mean there are suggestions like the way manrega and manrega is considered to be backbone of the rural economy right very important for rural economy in fact we have seen during the times of the covid it was the manrega only that actually saved people from getting into deep poverty it, it was the manrega who actually supported the rural economy of our of our country specifically the agriculture and other related works very very important uh, part manrega and now there are suggestions that the way manrega talks about giving a 100 days of unskilled work to the rural similarly we also need some kind of scheme uh, for the urban areas because in urban areas also we have this issue of unemployment now the government is working on that maybe in future you are going to have the same kind of scheme for the urban areas as well okay now what was the question number 25th 25th question was about the sagar mala project and it the question said what is the main objective of the sagar mala project okay so uh, we have uh, we have covered the sagar mala it's not a very new scheme in 2015 sagar mala project was launched <clears throat> go by the logic very simple logic uh, what can the sagar mala be so first of all you need to have a little bit of information about the sagar mala if you if you go by the name sagar mala project it is under the ministry of port shipping and waterways and it's a central sector scheme central central sector scheme you can understand 100% funding is going to be done by the center only all money from the center what is sagar mala it is the port led development of our country india has a huge 
coast line 7500 uh, 75, uh, 7, uh, kilometer of the coast line we have and we also have immense potential of our waterways navigable waterways as there so just to realize the the dream of blue economy and we want we want port led development to happen in india specifically in the coastal areas for that particular purpose 2015 sagar mala project was started by the government of india sagar mala project has five important pillars at least try to remember them and you will always get the right answer five pillars of sagar mala talks about port modernization new port development port connectivity enhancement port led industrialization coastal community development and coastal shipping inland water transport you see everything is connected interconnected to each other in general what they are what sagar mala says that we have to we have to develop the port areas and the nearby areas and that is how we are going to do the all the development along the coastline of india that is the sagar mala project it's a developmental project now you look at the options you now you can easily rule out sagar mala is it maritime security framework no is it about creating special economic zones no is it about developing a network of the inland waterways no it is a port led development of the country so that india can harness the true potential of our coastline and the waterways so yes it is this i think uh, it was a, it was a easy one and you should attempt it very straight forward question nothing much to guess about okay now and in general also in general also india does not have any uh, other projects in terms of maritime security something sagar mala is about the port led and this is one of the basic schemes so i expect you guys to know about it the next question is question 26 and this is about the operation barkhane now this is a very specific question i mean how can you uh, guess it there is no way to guess it it's a it's a pure fact based question you know it you know it you don't know it don't risk it operation barkhane was in news and it is about which of the particular reason it was actually the sahel region i would say it's a tough one if you have not heard about it please skip it do not go for it if you have read if you are 100 percent sure then you can talk about it what exactly was this uh, operation barkhane you should know it was it was basically an anti-insurgent operation that was conducted in the last eight years 2014 to 2022 operation barkhane was led by the french military in the french military was fighting the insurgent groups and where they were fighting against the islamic groups in the africa sahel region first look at the africa sahel region africa has many important regions one of them is sahel if you look at this particular line first look at this so here you have the sahara desert in africa and here you have the all the uh, all the all the moist areas where you have good uh, river drainage basins and you also have good grasslands and other plains in this particular area sahel region is between the sahara desert and the lower uh, moist area this is the in between area look at this this entire area this complete part is considered to be sahel it itself is a savanna region but it's a kind of dry savanna, not very well. It's a it's a dry savanna region, uh, kind of grassland, uh, you can say, but not complete. But it is between the drier Sahara. All areas to the north of Sahels are very very arid areas. Areas to the south of Sahel is considered to be very moist areas, right? And this is somewhere in between. We have the Sahel areas. Now in this entire area, we had a problem of many Islamist groups, and there were many insurgent groups also, right? Now the French army started this operation, Operation Barkhane, and it was it, this operation was carried out with the cooperation of the G5 Sahel countries, which are the G5 Sahel countries. Look at these countries which were supporting the operation. You have the names in front of you. We have the Chad, Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Mauritania. These five are called G5 Sahel region countries. They were all part of this operation Barkhane okay now facts are facts you have to be very good with them so i think this was a this was a tough question and very fact based question question 27 was about that you are supposed to figure out how many of the above constitutional provisions are related to affordable housing under the pradhan mantri avas yojana now this question my friend is a tough one is a hard one now you, we all know about pradhan mantri avas yojana okay this is all about the affordable housing that we have to provide to the people of India. Fine. This is the central idea. Please pick up this line. This Yojana is about what? This is the core objective of this Yojana, right? 
Now you are given the four, four uh, articles of the constitution. Number one, if you are not able to remember which article is about what particular thing, the question is gone. Then also you have to dig deeper into your knowledge. Like for example, article 21 is about the right to life. You would say, sir, right to life. Okay, right to life. But how right to life is going to uh, uh, talk about the housing? This is not there. But look at the perspective. Is right to life complete without affordable housing? If you really want to, uh, you know, go by the logic of right to life and personal liberty, right to life also includes you need to have a dignity uh, in terms of, uh, you know, where you live. So affordable housing by default is considered to be essential part of right to life. Are you getting my point? So that's why knowing about the article is important. And somewhere all the four items, all the four articles, they talk about the affordable housing. How? Please try to understand. Like we have just discussed article 21, right to life and property. It must include right to adequate housing. Article 38, which talk about the, uh, the state should try to go for the social order for promotion of the welfare of the people. Do you think welfare of the people can be done without adequate means of livelihood? No. Without livelihood and then also there has to be adequate standards of living. And that is where the Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana comes. 38 also has. There is no direct application. Please understand. This is a tough question. Know where it is mentioned directly. But it is talking about the essence is still there. Similarly, Article 46, which talk about promoting education, promoting economic interest of the scheduled tribe, scheduled uh, uh, caste people and other weaker section, right? And now you see in Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana, who are the main beneficiaries? Affordable housings are provided to the people of SC, ST and other weaker sections. So by default, 46 is about talking the economic interest, the welfare of these particular people. No direct mention, hidden meaning you have to pick out. Similarly, Article 15, 1A, which talk about, which is a fundamental duty, and there also it is, it is given that you know, uh, in, as a fundamental duty, we should go by improving natural environment, safeguarding public property, and in this particular duties, it is also relevant. We need to have the implementation of Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana because it is about providing housing with the basic amenities and environmental protection. So yes, in that particular sense, of course, it's a tough question. There is no direct application, but trust me, this is what UPSC looks about. In most of the cases, what my personal experience says, in most of the cases, the choices are going to be right. All you have to think is you have to read, just calm your mind and think about that particular Yojana and somewhere you will get the lead. It's a tough one. I, I will not suggest you to go blindly, but try to risk it because you know, if you have even get a go, uh, if you have got a one single reading of that article, you have to have the knowledge how to apply that particular part and try to get the essence. Everything government is doing in terms of fundamental right, in terms of DPSPs, of course, they are going to have you give you something about the affordable housing. Question number 28 is with respect to the CAG, the Comptroller and Auditor General of India. Very, very important question. Very important topic it was. Now, this question is all about the knowledge that you have about the CAG. So, first, let's see what you are supposed to learn about the CAG and then we'll come back to the question how to approach it. So, when you talk about the CAG, the Controller General, Auditor, uh, Controller and Auditor General of India, first of all, remember it is an independent position and the purpose of CAG is to ensure and promote the accountability of the executives of the people, of the parliament. How it does that? Basically, the CAG, CAG is going to invest, audit all the, uh, the records of uh, the parliament, of, of the central government, of the state government and other authorities which are, which are uh, given, uh, which are, you know, uh, which, which is asked about the parliament to go and check the accounts. This is a very powerful office. It is about the accountability of the executive. So, of course, this particular office needs to be independent. And how you are going to make it independent, guys? It is, it is independent because president can remove the CAG based on the resolution. You can't remove at your own will. If you want to remove the CAG, the CAG is removed on the same manner as that of the Supreme Court. Look at the level. It is not easy to remove a CAG because there is a whole cumbersome process which is there. So CAG is to be removed with the same procedure set for the Supreme Court of India. And similarly, similarly, 
the president has to remove the CAG, then he has to pass a resolution first by both the houses. That resolution needs to be passed with a majority of, of the total membership and also majority of not less than two third of the member present and voting. This is called the special majority. You need to have a special majority and also to remove the CAG, there has to be certain reasons. CAG can only be removed if there are evidences of proved misbehavior or incapacity. So that is why so much powerful office is being created because the responsibilities of the CAG is very, very important. We call it as the friend of the public account. Basically, the main purpose of the CAG is the auditing. Every account of union and state government or any authority which is prescribed by the parliament, it is going to do the audit for that. Okay. But please be very careful, CAG is appointed by the President of India, but that is not done on the recommendation on any three member committee. There is a simple process, How, which, who, which is going to be the CAG, there is a simple process for that. Right now what we does, it is the cabinet secretary who prepare a list and that list is given to the finance minister, okay these are the possible candidates uh, uh, basic on some of the criteria. Then finance minister give that list, short list to the pri pri prime minister. And Prime Minister recommends one name from that list to the President and then President of India appoint the CAG under the hand and seal of the of his uh, warrant, right? That is how the, the appointment is done. Now, if you look at the question back, guys, the question has a problem with the statement number three. It said the, the CAG is appointed uh, uh, by recommendations on the three member committee. That is not the case. For the, for the purpose of the CAG, it is not there. It is not about, it is, now this committee was more about the election commission of India. Look, election commission of India, members are appointed by this three member committee with prime minister, leader of opposition and chief justice of India. And now also that has, that is being uh, changed. Instead of chief justice of India, the new rule says that it is going to be one uh, minister, which is appointed by the central government. Okay, so of course this CAG is only, the. by the way I have told you the process is there, it is not uh, rec uh, recommended by any three member committee, it is for the election commission of India, not for the CAG. Remove it, first and second is absolutely correct, there is no problem, answer has to be A. So um, this, I think this is a medium kind of question, you <clears throat> should attempt it, fact based. Uh, maybe this uh, statement number three can give you a problem, but now we have discussed then it should not give you a problem. I understand it's a tough one, but uh, go for it guys. That, that's how you, are, you have to prepare for the UPSC. <clears throat> Question number 29 is again about the election commission of India. We just have mentioned that. And about the election commission of India, you again, you need to have a good amount of information. Very small, small information is important. Like for example, uh, this particular question says that election commissioners are other than election commission, chief election commissioners are eligible for the reappointment. That is not the case because you see election commission is a very, very powerful office, needs to be impartial all the time. And that is why every member which is going to be appointed should not be eligible for reappointment so that with utmost honesty, without any uh, fear or favor, they can work for the interest of democracy, not for the interest of the government. And that is why the any member of the election commission is not able, not uh, going to be reappointed. Once you are appointed, then done. Then you will get all the other benefits, but you will never be reappointed at any other post. Okay. Now, very interestingly, now first there are few things that you need to know about it. And that's how uh, uh, we'll come back to the question and we'll discuss. So now we have just understand, make you understand election commission of India as a permanent body. It is independent constitutional body. It, it is uh, with the article 324, 329. You have every provision of the election commission of India. Though there is no specific qualification that who is going to be the election commission of India and how you are going to get that. But of course, there are there uh, ultimately it is it is determined by the president how many number of election commissioners are, are used to be there. Uh, before 1990s, only election commission of India was only a one member body. Now it is a three member body. At the, we have one chief election commissioner and there are two election commissioner. But don't think that one is, uh, every decision is to be taken by, by the majority. Two is to one ratio has to be there. And please remember, all the three have equal status and equal rank. It is just the post name is different. Otherwise, perks and power is absolutely the same. Very important. And similarly, even the chief election commissioner is given the security of the tenure. I mean, like the way we have discussed the CAG. The way CAG is to be removed only by the procedure following for the Supreme Court judge removal. Similarly, if you want to remove the election commission of India, 
then only then also you have to uh, the procedure have to be of that supreme court uh, uh, judge removal kind of procedure so very hectic procedure so as to safeguard the autonomy and independence something you are uh, you need to understand like we have just discussed all the members are not going to be they are not eligible for the reappointment uh, and every member is going to give get a term of 6 years or whatever the maximum age is 65 so 6 years or, or 65 years of the age whatever uh, gets first that is going to be the case but be very careful guys many people have this doubt that election commission of india is responsible for the uh, election of every election that is happening in the country but that is not the case you talk about election commission of india it is only about it it only administers the elections of lok sabha rajya sabha state legislature state legislative councils even the office of president and vice president that's it but when it comes to the elections of panchayat when it comes to the elections of municipalities it is not the domain of election commission of india it is not concerned panchayat and municipalities we have specifically we have the state election commissioner when we passed the 73rd amendment act and 74th amendment act there we also had established the state election commission state election commission is only about the elections of these local level uh, elections now some people may get confused some people say okay state election for the state uh, uh, council no that is not the case vidhan sabha the state legislative assembly is still under the election commission of india it is only the local level panchayat and municipalities elections done by state election commission also remember state election commission now do not think there is any hierarchy in there the election commissions do not have any hierarchy election commission of india has its own domain state election commission of india is not under the election commission of india it is a rather an independent constitutional body so there is no devolution of the power there is no hierarchy it is not like eci uh, uh, you know uh, give suggestions or control the state election commission state election commission altogether a different body it is not under the hierarchy now go back to the question and you will see why some statements are wrong now look at the uh, statement number 4 that is what we are discussing it says state election commission is working under the direction of the election commission of india no it is an independent it is independent and it is not under the election commission of india okay look at the third statement it says election commission of india has the power of controlling the elections of parliament state legislature state level body local body definitely not local body for local bodies we have state election commission okay so now two we have uh, we have uh, uh, you know removed and similarly the f the second is also wrong it says that they are eligible for the reappointment they are not eligible for the reappointment so answer has to be a um, i think if this particular question was a tough one uh, you can risk it only if you are able to eliminate at least two or three statements if you if you know that at least two or three statements are wrong then only you should attempt if you have absolutely no idea then you must skip it otherwise it's a it's a fact based question but now since you have learned few things here you can also read the pdf but do not make any uh, uh, mistake in your prelims right that is important the next question is about the national commission for the backward classes called the ncbc now this again this commission is absolutely very very important national commission for backward classes was in news way back in 2018 why it was in the news now look at the first statement it says this was set up as a constitutional body 1993 now half information is correct half is not national commission for backward classes was set up in 1993 this statement is right but by the by that time it when it was set up it was just a statutory body it was not a constitutional body it was given the status of a constitution, uh, constitutional body in 2018 that is why it was in news five five six years back so first statement is absolutely wrong in this particular case now you need to have certain knowledge about other information i i think this is again a very uh, fact based question so a uh, first statement why it is wrong i told you guys it is 102nd amendment act then only it got it, it got a constitutional body status and for that matter we have introduced the article 338b now please remember right now article 338 is about the welfare uh, and the national commission for the scheduled caste then we have 338a which is about the national commission for scheduled tribes they are different earlier everything used to be one under 338 but now we have got the segregation and similarly we have 338b 
for this for the backward classes that is there okay the three things are different also remember one thing very clearly now who is the social economic backward class who is going to decide it see the president of india has a power to specify that in the central list which particular caste are to be considered as socially and economically backward caste classes right but please remember this president has a control over only on the central list i mean the state governments they can prepare their own list which is which can be independent of the president list as well so do not think that the president is going to dictate the state as well as center any state can have its own list because uh, you know it is it is like that you know every state knows better which particular caste is going to be more socially economically backward a caste may not be socially economically backward at, at the national level but maybe it is suffering and having difficulty at a state level that is why state is given the power to have its own list if it is required that is important it, it is not like president decided decide for both state and center it is not like that okay and there is a structure the national commission for backward classes has a particular structure at the top we have a chairperson we have a vice chairperson and three other members all are going to be appointed by the president their job is to investigate and monitor implementation of every possible policy for the safeguarding the interest of the backward classes under the constitution laws and it is mandated it is it is mandatory the national commission for backward classes is going to give annual resident, uh, 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 reports to the president and that president is going to table those report in the parliament and for that matter guys for investigation and other part this N ncbc like the way we have for schedule caste and schedule tribe even this commission has the power of a of a civil court while investigating and inquiring into the complaints it has the power of a civil court now if you go back to the question um, again it's a very heavy information based question the first statement is wrong i told you second is yeah second is correct it is appointed by president look at the third statement carefully it says president specifies the state social economically backward classes for central and the state list no it is not always remember whenever whenever it is about the social welfare please understand whenever it is about some kind of social welfare always remember that state have their own power because state is more responsible towards these kind of people than the center and social welfare you know specifying the beneficiaries it is always the responsibility of the state government to identify the people because state government is more connected to the people so going by that logic the third statement looks wrong and it is wrong the president is only about the center the state has its own list with respect to sc bcs so only one statement is correct i i would say uh, yes it was a tough one uh, definitely but you can risk it if if you know some some about it uh, you can risk it i i will not say you should skip because still you can you can eliminate a few i mean this this may give you a little bit trouble but now if you go with if you know the logic then you can eliminate but second and third can clearly be uh, solved with a common sense right so yeah it's a tough one but you should you should risk it do not skip it all together we ha we we have certain information to figure out the things now the question 31 was about the central consumer protection authority a uh, very very important uh, very very important uh, question this central consumer protection authority it is a statutory body for the consumer protection act 2019 this statement is absolutely correct now you think you i mean yeah this act the year is something you have to be careful about i mean they may get give uh, they may confuse you by saying consumer protection act 2023 22 be careful about the years because every act every amendment has to be correct with the with the year also but in this case we have uh, this is a very special act by the way guys every consumer protection right now in the country it is uh, it is under the consumer protection act 2019 also remember another important uh, is the company company act 2013 uh, that is also very important with respect to every company matter similarly with respect to every consumer protection it is the only act that we should be care, uh, careful about now second statement is a little bit problem we have the national consumer disperse uh, dispute redressal commission that is the commission where where all the cases are taken up but this particular commission is going to entertain the complaint of those cases which are having not 1 crore only but 2 crore only minimum dispute has to be minimum it has to be 2 crore or plus 
then only the case is going to go to the national consumer dispute because it is not going to entertain for every small petty cases it is not the case so the second statement looks uh, wrong it's a, it's a medium one i think you should you should attempt it guys it's a, it's a very fact based question if you if you have read the facts you can straight away solve it the answer has to be a so now you know what what the problem was the problem was with the amount that is the main problem okay and and uh, looking at the consumer protection authority always remember these five things are the main domains of this particular act i mean it is going to protect promote enforce which particular kind of matter any matter of the violation of the consumer right if there is any kind of misleading advertisement if it has to impose the penalties if there is any violation of the interest of the consumer unfair trade practices and safety notices for consumers against unsafe goods and services so that is the major objective that is done by the this particular consumer protection authority and always rem also remember that it can also take cases on its own it can cases it can it, it can start investigating cases suo moto on its own even without complaint it can go and proceed and uh, it can uh, uh, take the action that is important guys right okay and one thing you have to be careful like the amount we have already mentioned about the 2 crore plus but also remember guys that um, uh, if there is any discrepancy if you have to f uh, file against the order of the nc drc it is just a matter of 30 days within 30 days you have to you have to uh, file your complaint of you have to give uh, submit your uh, you know grievances to the supreme court if you have to appeal against it only 30 time period is there that is the case and one more thing also the again for something for the prelims you should remember this particular national commission for the uh, grievance redressal it is always headed by a sitting or a retired judge of a supreme court or sitting retired judge chief justice of the high court both are eligible even supreme court and high court judges are eligible for heading this kind of commission important okay now these are small small facts that you have to be careful about question number 32 was about the decadal census very very important two keywords here one is the census and another is the national population register very oftenly people have some confusion about the census and the national population register now please first you know little basics about these two we we all have heard about the census many times we know that in india every 10 years we have this periodic comprehensive enumeration and we take every possible data of our citizens very confidential information we have the census act 1948 which is the legal framework and the whole subject of the census it lies with the union government it is with the union list entry 69 that there is exclusive power of the central government to take to conduct the census in india and the census is conducted by office of registrar general census commission ministry of home affair is ultimately responsible for that unfortunately 2021 census is being delayed it's we are already 3 years late in conducting that particular thing very very info, important thing is every information which is taken in the census it is always going to be confidential and it is not even accessible to the court of the law nobody can access that information very confidential information is always uh, collected in in this particular census but that is not the case with the npr like the way we have the we have the census there is another exercise called the npr national population register please remember national population register is simply a list it's a list of the usual resident of the country that may include indian and the foreign nationals also what do you mean by the term usual resident usual resident means anybody who is living in that particular area for 6 months or anybody who is going to live or planning to live in india for the 6 month anybody can be indian can be foreigner also and also there is no any there is not any specific cut off date the cut off date is there in the nrc in the nrc we have a specific date with, uh, with respect to the assam accord but national population register is simply a usual resident list where or anybody who is living in india for the last 6 months or going to live that is going to be added here the objective is simple why we are creating npr objective is simple to identify the database of every usual resident that is there in our country for that purpose we have this list now if you look at the statement the first two looks pretty much clear absolutely there is no problem with the first two statement the third is bit problematic it says npr is it a verified digital register of indian citizen no it is simply a list it's a list of the usual residents and it there is there is absolutely no cut off date cut off date concept we have with the 
NRC that is that is there in the Assam. So here the first and second are correct. I think uh, um, this last statement is a bit confusing. First two I think it's good. There's no problem. It's a media one. You you can risk it. Uh, you can go with the elimination also. Here here if you if you look at the elimination technique, you can also eliminate the third one. If you have read about it once, you can simply eliminate it. First and second are very obvious and clearly you can figure out the, st the answer has to be B. You can eliminate because, uh, and but, but for that matter, I suggest you please read about the three. Sensex, NPR and NRC, all three are important. Very close, may confuse you a little bit about that. Question number 33 is about the Uniform Civil Code, the UCC. It is sometime in the news. Of course, it is in the news uh, right now also. It is um, uh, when the Uttarakhand, Uttarakhand become the first state in the country after independence. They have literally passed a law for the UCC. Now, it says it is mentioned in Article 44 of the DPSPs, yet the article is absolutely important. Now, there are some, some particular topics you have to be very, very aware of the articles. I mean, you cannot make any mistake. UCC is a burning topic right now. And it is about Uniform Civil Code. What is a Uniform Civil Code? Now, right now in India, many like there are some civil laws which are not uniform for every religion. Civil, some civil laws specifically in terms of marriage, specifically in terms of divorce, in terms of inheritance, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, succession. There are few or adapt, uh, in, you, if you have to adopt somebody, there are these four or five matters are there for which every religion has its own law. We have, we have Muslim personal law, we have Hindu marriage act, you know, we have for every religion in, in our country. These are the matter where there is no uniformity and everybody operates in these matter as per their personal laws. But in article 44, it is said, it is clearly said that the government of India, you know, shall endeavor to secure all the citizens a uniform civil code throughout the territory of India so that we can replace the personal laws. Because right now there are hundreds and hundreds of personal laws that complicate the entire system of the civil law. Like the way we have, like in case of CRPC. The criminal procedure code, it is same. It is throughout in the country same. At, like just to give you an example, if you if somebody uh, somebody uh, murder somebody for for a murder for the murder the punishment is same for everyone. Now the the punishment is not going to be decided based on your religion. Similarly, we want that in the in the UCC, in UCC for every single thing there has to be one law applying to all the citizens to so that. So that uh, it is going to, uh, you know, remove the discrepancies that are, that are there. Well, in India, you, like Uttarakhand has become the first state to pass a UCC. Very recently, it was it was in February month only. But but in Goa, there is already a civil code. But that civil code was started by Portuguese civil code. It was it was by the colonial Portuguese rulers. They have started, uh, uh, you know, they have started. And Goa is, even in Goa, even today, even after liberation, we have this Portuguese civil code going. So both statements looks absolutely right. There is no doubt. It's a very easy one and uh, something that everybody knows, right? Important. So please make sure that you, that you read more about the UCC. That is really, really important, guys. Question number 34 is a very, very important and a tricky question. It, it is with respect to Indian economy and you are supposed to, figure out which statement best describe the term surety bonds. I would say it's a very tough question because it's, it is not a very common word. Say surety bonds, if you have absolutely no clue, you cannot figure out. If you have, if you have not heard about it, please do not risk it. Please skip it altogether. But just to give you the idea what exactly surety bonds are. Surety bonds in this particular case, the answer is actually A. It's a three-party contract. Now, just to give you very, very simple explanation how the shorty bond work. It, it's a three-party contract. Which three parties are there? One is your, this is party one, this is party two, this is party three. The first party is actually the party uh, that is an insurance firm. We have an insurance firm. This is, a, this is an insurance firm or insurance company. And the second one is, let's say, the contractor. And the third is the government. Okay. Now, normally what happens now government wants to make a building. Let's say government says, okay, uh, we want to build a road. Okay. Government, government has a project on the road construction. Now government said, okay, who is going to build that road? And this contractor is willing 
uh, and uh, there is an agreement between the contractor and the government and government but government wants to be sure that are you able to fulfill the conditions are you able to pull off the task now in this particular case comes the insurance firm insurance firms issue it 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 is the insurance firm that actually issues the surety bonds and the surety bond is issued by insurance firm and it takes the responsibility of this contractor it says don't worry gov it it, it uh, tells government don't worry it is my responsibility i am giving surety on the behalf of this contractor that your agreement contractual obligations will be fulfilled and that is where the surety bonds come who issues them insurance firm on whose behalf contractor the second party and the third one being the government so that is how the surety bond work it's a tough one i am not saying it is an easy one but now the way i have explained you now i think it becomes an easy one well just to give you a little bit more technical information on surety bonds it is a promise to be liable for the debt default failure of the another whose another here let's say the contractor is there and it's a three party contract one party is the surety party like in our example it was the insurance firm that is the surety party and the second party is the principal party who's the principal party the contractor is the principal party and who's the third party the obligee is basically the government okay now remember that three that example i gave you of the three people it's a three party contract so in this case answer has to be a question 35 was was with respect to the monetary policy of india very important question monetary policy okay before i tell you anything please be very careful there are two important policies that we have in in our country one is the fiscal policy another is the monetary policy monetary policy is majorly taken care by the reserve bank of india and the fiscal policy is majorly with respect to the central government of india okay that they try to remember these two words monetary is with money okay monetary with respect to money money is in the bank which bank reserve bank okay go with go by that kind of logic fiscal government why because you have seen government is always under some kind of fiscal deficit ha na governments are always under fiscal deficit some way or the other so fiscal is to go with the central government of india now if you read about it now monetary policy is something that we have we, in 2016 we have uh, uh, established the monetary policy com committee of our in in our country and it's a six member body okay it is headed by finance minister no it is not monetary policy committee and there was a question uh, in 2017 there was a question on the mpc also it's a six member body the three members are going to be from the reserve bank of india the three member are going to be appointed by the central government but it is the rbi governor RBI governor is by default ex officio chairman of the monetary policy committee very important please remove this particular one when i have removed this you see all the th two options are gone now i am left with only these two two and three i am left with so now you have you for very short you can say sir second statement looks very correct and it is correct the main objective of the monetary policy committee is 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 basically about how to control the inflation in our country right but the third statement has a problem look at the third statement it says monetary policy decides the inflation target of the country no it inflation how much inflation has to be there in the economy it is not decided by the monetary policy inflation target is actually done by the government with consultation with the monetary policy committee and once the government gives the target decided by the target decided by the government right now it is 4% which inflation the retail inflation retail inflation the cpi the consumer price inflation so government says okay in our economy 4% inflation is what we required with a plus minus band of 2 it can be minimum 2% maximum 6% De inflation target is decided by the government but that implementation is the responsibility of the monetary policy committee so first is incorrect third is incorrect and in case monetary policy is not able to achieve this target then yes rbi has to explain the reasons why it failed to meet those inflation targets what are the remedial suggestions then it is responsibility target fixed by the government so in this case my only answer is b it's a medium question do risk it you you have in this question you have a chance of elimination so please try to eliminate and very like with the, with respect to the third statement 
please read the statements very very careful because the statements are absolutely important sometimes we make this mistake so do not make this mistake read about it very very carefully and from 2004 uh, 2016 we have got this uh, uh, monetary policy committee into the function and also remember guys that this monetary policy committee was established under the rbi act 1934 it has to meet minimum four times a year right now uh, it is meeting six times a year which is a good thing okay now the next question is about the term short selling now this is also a very technical question if you are not good with eco economics if you have not read the economics well then of course the things becomes difficult for you now the question number 36 talking about the short selling what exactly it means what is short selling short selling now i'll i'll explain you simple uh, in a very simple way i'll tell you uh, if you know know the logic about it if you have if you have a bit of knowledge of the stock market then you know that you can understand the topic well normally what happens guys now normally what we what we do if you you want to invest in the stock market you simply purchase a stock you know you buy a stock let's say you 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 bought a stock at let's say 100 rupees uh, right and then you wait for it to grow and when it becomes 125 130 then you want to sell it that's how you make a profit but that is where the uh, the stock market is uh, is is a bull economy or a bull stock market where the prices are going up that is one scenario there are there are other ways of making profits in the stock market and then comes the short selling strategy what is a short selling strategy it is basically a trading strategy where any investors first it borrow a stock from a broker i buy first okay now i am buying something at 120 rupees i have bought this stock and I am very hopeful that market will crash. I am buying it first and and here I, I, I have bought it from the stock uh, from the broker right and then this particular stock I am going to sell first. I am going to sell it in the market at 120 and then it will the price will come down because we are hopeful that it is it is going to be a beer economy where the price is the market will come down. So I am selling it first okay i am selling the the stock first and when the prices will come down here somewhere let's say it has become 80 or something the 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 markets are crashing there i'm going to buy it again so the difference of the selling price and, and the buying price becomes my profit now short selling was actually in the news when when there was a news on the hinderberg report if you if you have heard about this there's the hinderberg report which has uh, which was there with respect to the adani company and adani share started falling so basically what happens if you are if you are very sure the market is going to go down so you sell the stock first and you buy it back later with the lower price and the difference becomes your profit that is that is another way of making profit in the stock market but that is called short selling so if you look at the statement it is the first one it's a tough one i i will say please skip it if you have no clue only if you are 100% sure then only you can solve it because you see every single statement is very very close to each other so answer has to be a in this particular case okay now the next question is about with respect to the gst council so what you are supposed to learn about the gst council guys now gst council everything you have to figure out which statements are correct okay so first statement says that gst council is it's a statutory body is it a statutory body no it is a constitutional body if you know the facts about it you know that GST council in India uh, uh, after GST was applied in 2017 no in 2017 Indian government has rolled out the GST uh, uh, act now in that particular way we have established GST council and it is a constitutional body we have we have established GST council under the article 279a with 100 constitutional amendment act way back in 2016 very very important gst council is a very important body it's a federal forum why i call it as a federal form forum because in gst council you have the representation of the center as well as representation of the states both center and states come together at this gst council for the implementation and the administration of the goods and service tax always remember gst council chairperson is always going to be the union finance minister right now the nirmala sitaraman ji is the chairperson of the gst council now second thing you have to remember about this council 
is the voting how the voting take place in this gst council please remember the central government has one third of the total vote the weightage of the vote is one third that is held by the central government the state governments taken together all the state governments of every single state together they have two third weightage of their voting this is basically to balance out the powers of the center and the state that is it is done but please remember every decision of gst council is taken by majority of not less than three fourth of the weighted votes at least at least there has to be three fourth voting at a particular thing then only the decision is taken that is the way gst council works and for a gst council to have a meeting there has to be at least 50 percent members to be available that is considered to be the quorum minimum number of member that is required to conduct the proceedings of the council is 50 percent member also remember the finance ministry has uh, uh, recently the gst council uh, has a very important provision with respect to gst compensation says what is the gst compensation says you know uh, by the, the time when gst was rolled out in 2017 the states were worried the state said okay now since by the by the rolling out by the implementation of the gst law they are they were fearful that they are going to lose the revenue initially and for for uh, taking care of the interest of the state the st the gst council said that don't worry we we are going to give you some compensation so gst compensation says was uh, imposed on certain goods and services and this was the this was for the compensating the loss for the uh, for the states but that was till 2022 but now that same extension compensation says is extended till 2026 because of course in in between we have the covid years the economy went through a very rough patch now that compensation says is till 2026 very important also remember guys that now you know right now uh, there used to be a national anti-profiting authority there used to be a body uh, uh, whose main task was to you know serve to uh, pass the benefits of any rate reduction of the gst to be passed to the consumers but since the GST council has started, the national anti-profiting authority was abolished by the government. And now we have the Competition Commission of India. It is their responsibility. They have to ensure that all the benefit, if any GST rates are reduced, that benefit to be passed to the consumers, uh, that is the responsibility of the Competition Commission of India. They are, these are some basic facts that you have to remember. Now, if you come back to the question, the first statement is fine, GST council statute. No, it is not. It is not a statute rate. It's a constitutional body. The first is not correct. Second statement says uh, decisions taken by not less than three fourth. Yeah, that is fine. But be careful. This is a factual thing. UPSC may say, okay, by two third majority, but for the GST, it is three fourth because in special majority, you may have maximum decisions are two third. But for the GST council, it is three fourth. That is some specific star mark. Okay, uh, compensation says extended. Yes, we have we have told you this also. And uh, the fourth statement is again wrong. It says it is the NAA, uh, the National Anti Profiting Authority, is the mechanism. Now you know it is being abolished. All the benefits of GST rate reductions are to be passed by Competition Commission of India. I would say it's a tough one. There is absolutely no doubt about it. It is a very technical question. Uh, you can risk it only if you know at least two or three statements you are comfortable with then only you can go for it otherwise these are the questions which you should skip you should not get into the trap of solving them because they may leave you in a bit of trouble now if you go little by the question number 38 which is about the Pradhan Mantri Vishwakarma scheme now which statements are not correct now be very careful I'm not asking the correct one the statement is asking about the not correct one this is also you always have to be careful about 90% questions are correct but sometimes there are 10% questions which are about incorrect or not correct Pradhan Mantri Vishwakarma scheme is it about is it a central sponsored scheme aims to support the traditional artisans and the crafts people it provide them with the credit facilities, skill training, modern tools and market linkage support. Okay, now very, very interesting and important question guys. Here, if you look, the first statement, it is not correct. Why? Now, I think the there is some problem with the state. It's a, yeah, it's a central sector scheme. Okay, now look at this, please. 
here it is said it is central sponsored is it centrally sponsored it is not it is not it's a central sector scheme the funding 100% funding is to be given by the central government so pm vishwakarma is central sector scheme so i i would suggest you because this confusion will always be there so what you can do right now try to make a list try to make a list okay these are the uh, schemes which are under center se sector scheme and these are the sponsored scheme so if you have a list then it becomes easy pradhan mantri vishwakarma is a very latest scheme so you expect questions from it in 2023 the government of india started it basically the purpose is to support all the artisan and the craft people and the craftsmen specifically who are engaged in the occupation of a blacksmith goldsmith potter carpenter basically we are going to support these people and this vishwakarma scheme ministries are again very important it is under the ministry of msme that we have we have the vishwakarma scheme now very very important and how you are so going to support now comes the logic how you will support the artist and the craft people we will support them by giving them collateral free credit we will give them skill training modern tools incentives for digital transactions market linkage support everything will be done but please careful be careful because you may be asked about the ministry and you know we're talking about the artist and the craft people sometimes you have a confusion it may be ministry of tribal affair maybe ministry of minority affair but the ministry here is msmes because ultimately the artist and the craft people they operate at a small business level no and since they are all small businesses and that is why the perfect ministry is the ministry of msme so going by that logic that makes sense no but here the first is incorrect second is correct you are supposed to find the incorrect one answer has to be a because it's a central sector scheme not the not the one i think it's a medium one uh, you can you can attempt it there is no problem uh, all you have to be little careful about the ministries and central sector and uh, the other part is there question 39 was about the sixth schedule very very important schedule in our constitution the sixth schedule is about providing and talking about the rights of the tribal people in these particular four states every time you read the sixth schedule always always try to read the fifth and sixth schedule together because fifth schedule is also talking about the protection and the welfare of the people of the scheduled area sixth is also talking about the same thing but the only difference is in sixth schedule we have specifically four states and the best way to remember them is by the definition called atmm i always use the word atm because we go to the atm atm we know right we, we go and withdraw the money so now you have to remember atmm okay we are going to the atm for money so atmm here you if you go by the logic it is assam meghalaya tripura it is not nagaland it is mizoram okay so these four uh, uh, states are covered under the six schedule six schedule provide for uh, having a uh, having hill area councils in india right now there are 10 uh, these um, uh, you know district councils we have autonomous district council we call them in in uh, these particular state these 10 automat uh, autonomous district councils are there for the representation and welfare of the people the local people the tribal people guys okay important then we have the inner line permit this is something very very important you have to know about the logic okay the first learn about the ipl what is the ilp not ipl ilp is there important so you now you know the sixth schedule is about which particular states now there is a concept called as the ilp inner line permit it's a statutory provision which is right now applicable in the state of uh, arunachal manipur mizoram and nagaland so here you can go with the a m m n these four are for the ilp now what is this inner line permit try to understand what it is about so there was a time uh, during the colonial rule the britishers they have started the system of inner line permit so all these uh, states the tribal areas of our country specifically the north eastern states of our of our country because britishers had a lot of interest in the forest areas of that time right so now britishers started this inner line permit system which is basically an inner uh, you know a permission that you need to enter into some specific area so right now if you are going into these particular states you need to have inner line permit why it was done because britishers want wanted that no outsider should come and grab the resources similarly after independence even indian government has retained this particular system where india now now if you if there is any outsider nobody can go to these states without a permission 
because we really do not want to compromise the resources of that particular area. So to protect the interest of the localites, the tribal people, the forest dwellers, that is why the inner line permit is there. And these are the four states which are being covered here. And whenever you have to think about the tribe and tribal communities, please always remember the first name is the president of India. It is the president of India who decides the scheduled areas. It is the president of India who decides the scheduled tribes. Who is going to be a scheduled tribe with respect to state UT? That is that also can be done. But of course, when president is deciding about who is going to be included as a scheduled tribe, of course, for that matter, consultation with the governor is must. After consultation with the governor, it is the president who is going to decide that, okay, this particular tribal community needs to be covered uh, as the ST. That is very, very important, guys. Okay. And for that matter, there is very specific provisions are there under the article 342 in our constitution. Now, if you go there, now you will understand, okay, the first statement was wrong that we have decided. The second and third looks pretty much okay. It's a statutory provision. The, always be careful with the states. The names and the states are important. So anywhere you find any doubt, and this is again, this is a fact-based question. No logic applied, nothing. No logic, nothing. But you have to go with the facts. It's a, it's a tough one, I would say. Uh, you can risk it if you know, but otherwise you can skip it. Because the questions are really tough. The questions are not, I, 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 I'll not say that questions are easy, they are tough. Last question with respect to the Central Armed Police Forces. Very, very important question. And this CAPF is something which is in the news recently. Why it was in the news recently? Because very shocking numbers are there. These CAPF personals are actually suffering from big time depression. These people are suffering from suicidal tendencies. Lot of suicides uh, in the last, uh, uh, between 2017 to 2022. Almost more than 650 suicides uh, were there uh, committed by the by the personals of Central Armed Police Forces. So this was in news for many reasons. But now the question is about the CAPF. Let me give you some briefing about it. And be again very careful. The question is about which statement is not correct. Here also you are supposed to figure out which statement is not correct. So if you, if you go by um, the Central Armed Police Forces, basically this is an umbrella term. Central Armed Police Forces, it's an umbrella term. Within that CAPF, we have seven paramilitary forces. It's a common name used for seven paramilitary forces of our country. All the seven paramilitary forces are under the administrative control of Ministry of Home Affairs. This is very, very important. All seven paramilitary forces, I'm talking about the administrative control. Now, you, which are those seven paramilitary forces? Assam Rifle, the CRPF, the Border Security Force, the CISF, NSG, Indo-Tibetan Police Force, and the Sahastra, Sahastra Sena Bal. These seven are the paramilitary forces, all under administrative control of Home Affairs. But the Assam Rifle having administrative control of the Ministry of Home Affairs, but its operational control lies with the lies with the Indian Army. Means Indian Army is going to decide where and how the Assam rifle is going to be operating. For other, for other, the administrative as well as operative, both rights lie with the Home Affairs Ministry. But specific case of Assam rifle, administrative control of Home Affairs, but operating control under the, under the, uh, uh, this thing, Indian Army. Okay, that, that is important. And where exactly Assam Rifle operate? What is the function, domain of the Assam Rifle? Because it was also very much in the news. Be careful. Though all these CAPF, this complete armed police forces, the reason why we have them, because if there is any situation in terms of internal security, border guarding, counter-terrorism, disaster management, it is the CAPF which is responsible for carrying out all these tasks. Of course, they are going to assist, assist the state and central police forces in maintaining the law and order also. But when you talk about the Assam rifle in particular, it is their job. They have a two-tier two, uh, job. Number one, they are responsible for guarding the Indo-Myanmar border. Very important. Specifically for Indian Myanmar border, you have the Assam rifle. And number two, if there is any counter-insurgency operations, specifically for the northeast, then also you have specialization done by the Assam Rifles. Right now, Assam Rifle 2 units are also being deployed in Jammu Kashmir. 
because they are specialist of counter insurgency so now assam rifle is also operating in jammu kashmir other than northeast okay if you know if you keep these uh, uh, facts in mind just try to look at the question which was being asked look at the question guys the question is about the caapf under administrative control of ministry of home affairs yes but aap assam rifle operational control of the indian army absolutely correct but look at the second one second statement says capf responsible for all these functions that is correct but assam rifle entrusted only with counter insurgency it is not only now the problem is with the word only na other than counter insurgency they are also responsible for the indo myanmar border we have just learned they also are the border guarding forces indo myanmar border they also take care of that okay so which is a uh, uh, wrong which is not correct the second one is not correct i think this is a medium one uh, you should attempt it if you know about it and if, even if you are not very well about it and if you are not very sure about it again you have this clue only all very extreme words maximum 95% times you are going to have this statement as wrong if any statement has all only 95% chances it is it is wrong answer has to be b so that is all from my side in the in this particular video guys i hope you have enjoyed i i hope you have learned a lot of new things from this particular video my best wishes for your uh, upsc 2024 exam keep learning and keep solving the questions see you guys in the part number 3 with next 20 set of questions take care jai hind jai bharat